Hello and welcome everyone. It is Sunday, October 18th, 2020, and we are delighted to bring you here at Complexity Weekend 2020, a recording of the Future Fossils podcast. So if all of our panelists could re-enable their video, Michael, thank you so much for coming online to make this recording happen. Thanks everyone for being flexible as well as understanding with the technology. And we're really looking forward to this recording. So please, Michael, take it away. Excellent, welcome everyone. Future Fossils is, and has been since 2016, uh, about, trying to understand our, our place in the deeper uh, framing of of time. Uh, the, the music that I think some of you have already heard me uh, contributing to this, this conference this weekend was uh, part of a, an archaeological experiment on uh, a transfer learning by Leanne Gabora uh, in British Columbia, an archaeologist who uh, was studying the, uh, the Lewinmensch, the, the famous... 40,000 year old lion man sculpture. Uh, the earliest evidence that we have an object of something that came out of the human imagination that didn't exist in, in the world. A man with the body, uh, the head, the body of a man, the head of a lion. And, um, and I was invited uh, to participate in a project where she asked a number of artists and musicians to try and transpose that into different media, uh, music and art to you know think about so it's like really like this is you know this is kind of the, the waters that we're swimming in um i'm sorry that i haven't been more present for the rest of the conference but what i would like to do is 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 kind of keep that enormous time horizon and that uh that you know the, the playful attitude by which we think about how things can be moved from from one medium or one discipline into another medium and another discipline, and uh, how that actually happens, like how how it's occurring cognitively, and uh, we can start asking some questions that can ground and integrate uh, what has been going on this weekend and uh, what's been going on in the world generally lately and start start to see if we can synthesize and uh, distill and extract and uh, nourish, cultivate, fertilize some, some lessons here. So um, I would love to just, I don't know if everyone's uh, panel looks the same as my panel, but um, I would just say, go ahead and, Raise your hand, maybe, and I would just love to go around and have everyone introduce themselves, and uh, in in the vein that I just introduced myself, and then we'll start there. See, I'm looking up at let's see at Pietro. Can you go first, yeah. Pietro? We did this. I. I... I, I wasn't sure if you were referring to someone's ears or my headphones, but I, yeah. I'm glad I'm glad I guessed right. Uh, yeah, so hello, I'm Pietro Michelucci. I'm pleased to be here uh, for this event. It's my first complexity weekend ever. I hope it's not my last. And um, you know, Jen and I, uh, Jen, who's you know in one of these other uh, squares here, um, it's like Hollywood Squares for anyone who remembers that show. Uh, Jen and I had a great conversation, and one of the things that that I realized in talking with Jen and others here that, that I mentioned to her is that there's there's something you know again kind of linking complexity science to cognitive styles. There there there's something about people here that's different than people that aren't part of this kind of complexity thinking, uh, th this this way of thinking about problems, and I I think it's really about um, you know, abstraction, you know, and metaphors. Every time I have a conversation with somebody here, you know, they either pop up a level or pop over a level, you know, so it's kind of like mapping this, this problem, this idea onto this context or to a higher, more general level and then bringing it down somewhere else. And it's kind of like a universal way of thinking. And it's kind of exciting to find a whole bunch of other people who like to think this way. So anyway, that's my initial comment on this experience of Complexity Weekend. 
talk a little bit more about for because I, we're presuming that this will be uh, absorbed by people who have not been a part of this event. So please introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit about your work. Oh, sure. Sorry. So uh, yeah. So my, um, you know, I'm a cognitive scientist by training, and um, you know, which is which is the study of thinking, thinking in human systems and machine systems and animal systems and so on. And you know, what can we learn about uh, how to make sh machines think from how humans think, and vice versa. And and in particular, I'm interested in how we can build more powerful problem-solving systems by leveraging the respective strengths of different kinds of thinking systems, and in particular, humans and machines working together uh, in different ways. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think this, this field was originally dominated by computer scientists and still is, but I've always been fascinated about bringing other people into this field. And in fact, you mentioned Liane Gabora. Uh, I, I, um, I, I ran a, a summit at the Wilson Center uh, I think 2014, and uh, and you know invited her to join us, you know specifically because you know I had this idea that there truly this is a multidisciplinary field. We can learn so much about transfer of technology and ideas over time as well as space, and um, you know and her and her work in creativity is is fascinating uh, toward that. Um, so um, uh, yeah, and we can you know even even um, you know, animal scientists, you know, we, we can learn a lot about how to build collective systems by looking at nature's collective systems, which are very effective, you know, use social insects and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a broad field, my field of uh, what I, we call human computation, where we, again, we have human in the loop computing, and it intersects, I think, tremendously with complexity science. And I've always been very interested in how to get these two fields to intersect more. So I'm really excited about being here because it's an opportunity to engage with this community and potentially pursue, you know, more intersections between these two fields. Excellent, Jen. How about you? We'll just go around the the squares here. Yeah. I think your squares are, all of us probably have different organizations to our squares, but uh, first of all, let me apologize. I'm in my house and there's occasionally a lot of background noise. So if you hear dogs barking, just apologies ahead of time. So I'm uh, Jen Hoff. I am a anthropological archeologist, which, you know, when we're sitting here looking at forward thinking things, I think it seems like a, uh, weird match sometimes to some people because I tend to be really backwards thinking, but I loved you talking about the lion man because I know exactly what you're talking about um, as a as a it's not quite an artifact because you can't pick it up and carry it away because it's there in the cave and there's a couple other um, uh, like stone carvings that are in these features in the caves. But yeah, my scope of time starts like two and a half million years ago. And, uh, you know, thinking about technology change, it could be even, I mean, the oldest tools are 3.3 million years old. Uh, so I think about technology change, about uh, human evolution, uh, you know, kind of more concretely, I think about uh, like how we use social networks to both uh, manage risk and how they also create risk. Uh, and in these human landscape or human environment interactions. And I think those things are very, like they're not in our past. They're also things that are moving forward into the future. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm always, I'm interested in understanding where we've been, but it's out of being interested in knowing kind of where we're going. Uh, so I think that kind of just hopefully gives you an idea about where I'm going. I've been having some great conversations this whole weekend. You know, Pitcher and I spent like, we were like, it was like an hour and a half long. It was fantastic. So um, so that's a little bit, I mean, this is my second uh, complexity weekend. Uh, so I didn't make the in-person one, but I've done both of the virtual ones and, um, you know, come out of, uh, you know, kind of bringing, complexity science and complexity methods into thinking about what it means to be human. I think it's kind of my domain, so. Is there anything more concrete you'd like me to add? No, that's good. Tom? 
Yeah. Hi. Well, actually, I'm hold, hold on just a second. I, I, I just want to make, I just want to be clear about this. I'm, I'm not getting any, uh, feedback from the organizers that this is actually you, you all presumably have been familiar with this i apologize for this but i i don't know for a fact that this is going public anywhere we all could just be in a circle jerk right now <laughs> well there you go <laughs> i have been i've been trying to embed a uh, a, a youtube stream key for this and it's not working the the recording button isn't showing up anywhere um all right okay well is there where where do we see feedback if people have comments or Okay. All right. Sorry for that, folks. Tom, please continue. <laughs> All right. Try trying this again. So uh, right now, I am chair of a computer science department and coordinator of our cognitive science program. So interdisciplinary in those respects. My bachelor's degree was actually in philosophy. And I, I, I would say if I had to categorize, I'm a postmodern deconstructionist. Um, but uh, my doctorate was in pure mathematics. So, you know, some people think of those as the opposite ends of the spectrum, but I see the spectrum as a circle. So they link together. Uh, I've been teaching at a small, comparatively small undergraduate uh, state university in California for 40 years. Uh, but the other connection that I have with all of this stuff uh, I was born in Los Alamos, 20 miles from Santa Fe. So uh, at some point I got connected with the Santa Fe Institute and spent 15 years as resident faculty in the complex system summer school that the uh, Santa Fe Institute did. So uh, looking at trying to figure out all those connections, I will say uh, one of the classes that I teach is a culture and society class. Um, we read novels. We uh, look at digital culture, we look at Pandora's Hope. Uh, some of you may know Bruno Latour, a, uh, an anthropologist of science, one might say. Uh, but one of the things that always strikes me, uh, talking about the pre-Ice Age art world, uh, what Chauvet, Lascaux, those kinds of things, I, I like to think that there was a culture, an art, culture, a social culture that lasted. I mean, some of those cave paintings are clearly a continuous thematic and style over a period of what, 20 to 30,000 years. And I think about the art world today, if you weren't up with it two years ago, you're way out of touch with uh, what, what art styles are all about today and how that all works. I one of the things that frustrates me is that we do not have any audio recordings from Lasco and Chauvet. Uh, I, I I wish I wish I knew what music they did and how how they did that. And Michael, I love your pedal board. I, I <laughs> I've been trying to do that with with Zoom technology instead of Boss. But uh, one of the things that I do in my class is play live music and let the students uh, think about how that works. I start every class with a, a piece of music. Um, some of you may have read The Goldbug Variations by Richard Powers. I encourage you to track that down. And uh, his, his book, Overstory, has been trending the past six months or so. Uh, but it's it's based on well it it's framed the way the Goldberg variations by Bach are framed, and so there's sort of a semester long thematic of sort of walking through the variations and then tying those back to society and culture and where all that grows and goes. I'll I'll let that be sort of an introduction to me. Awesome. How about you, Rich?
Sorry, Richard, we still don't hear you. Maybe you can try switching your microphone setting. Is that better? There we go. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Certain co companies' um, products don't work as well. It's like a pair, but it's not. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah, my name is Richard uh, James McCowan, and I, um, I work in the field of biomimicry and problem solving. Um, my background is um, real estate finance and development. And I, I was fascinated at that time into behavioral economics um, and was working for a number of years until the economic crash and the kind of understanding how people, why they invest, where they invest it, and even just the study of cities. And when the economic crash happened in 2008 and got made redundant, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because um, I didn't want to be one of those um, a-holes in the suits walking around telling people what to do. I actually was wanting to actually go out and actually understand and make a difference instead of just making people more and more money. Um, and I reached into urban design and that kind of caught my bug about um, looking at actually landscape as well. And it reminded me a lot of growing up, um, spending time with my grandparents in the Highlands and learning about the relationships between the water running down the hills and into the lochs and then the connection between that and when um, fish farms came along and mussel farms and the pollutants that were put into the water, that, that impacted on the coastline, the increase in algae, then it impacted into the sea life and the, the marine and the mammals in the area as well. And it just all kind of flooded back of this complex um, relationship and the trade-offs that go on in the design sphere. So from that, I started studying biomimicry and um, looking into the natural world. Um, and now I find myself working with companies, uh, looking at design new products, developing machine learning systems as well, working products, you know, projects around the world, looking with um, using space-based data and that. I'm just intrigued about the crossover and domain, domains and taking things from one and putting into another. And listening to your music, Michael, remind me of a project. We did a um, prototype project a few years ago where we're recording different sounds in an ecosystem. And you find the ecological niche and the, um, how they communicate at either different times of day or the different frequencies and then you start viewing that you can actually see how you know in the urban environments how our noises are actually disrupting that so you're finding how they you know they've either adapted to urban environments or they haven't so you, you get you start thinking about how do you communicate in the forest is it the sounds is it the, you know a bit like the butterfly i showed is it is it using bright colors and things like that and it kind of gets you into this kind of communication through non-verbal means and I think that's great because it gets you started thinking about the beauty and the, you know, the poetry of nature. Mm. But also then the destruction that we're actually putting in there by our urban environments and not understanding that it's not just the, you know, the water we're polluting, but we're interrupting, disrupting a large swathe of the communication and how animals can actually, you know, get together because they just get confused. And I'm not just talking about the so-called death by... Um, you know, wind turbines. This is rich. Yes. I mean, so, sorry, no pun intended. Um, so <laughs> seriously. So, uh, you know, uh, Tom, you, you said uh, you wish that we had audio recordings from Lascaux. I don't know if you're familiar with Rupert Till. He is one of the, the first guests I ever had on Future Fossils. Uh, he's... Uh, the world's first PhD in electronic music. And, and four years ago, I met him in Portugal at the Boom Festival uh, because he was working on archaeoacoustics for the Lascaux Caves, as well as a couple other caves and reconstructing these spaces in virtual reality. And uh, he and I performed on the same stage at different times, but his performance was a, uh, an ambisonic, like six points around reconstruction, like a, of a sonic virtual reality in which he was, he was reconstructing the, uh, the paleolithic instruments and the sounds they made in the spaces in which they were actually performed. And the Lord only knows what they were, you know, what, what kind of songs they were playing he, that, you know, he provided the content, but, you know, Rich to your, to your point on the way that, uh, 
there's a there's a material agency involved in in all of this you know that i think a lot about that and i think it's you know when we're talking about transfer it's so curious that um these veins remain so consistent through thousands and tens of thousands of years in spite of the fact that uh we're talking about the stone age then and now we're talking about what you know i've i've come to think of over the last few years as the glass age you know here we are connected by screens silicon chips fiber optic cables you know a world defined by by uh you know beakers and and test tubes and so i'm i i just wonder you know i i would just love to hear any of you riff on uh, what it is that is actually changing uh, amidst all of this and why it is that it's staying the same. I mean, is it, is it simply, I mean, something about the fact that, uh, you know, we still, uh, obviously like I'm here in my like basement apartment on a hill, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm practically a caveman myself, you know, etching away at this stuff. Uh, the same way that somebody was etching away at the mammoth tusk to create the the lion man in the first place. So is it simply the continuity? Is it the human anatomy that creates this continuity? You know, there's something about the, like the, the extended mind uh, and the way that we are interfacing with everything else. Um, and I'm just going to trail off and leave it there and hope that, that you all, uh, have some thoughts on that. Well, having, having name checked, I, I just last week saw a thing about Stonehenge as a, an acoustic chamber. Uh, they, they're doing some, uh, as you say, a, a physical reconstruction of it uh, in, in an anechoic chamber and then looking at how the sound is, is amplified. And uh, apparently the big stones can reflect low frequencies, but the gaps between them permit the escape of higher frequencies. So what you get is an amplification of uh, sort of low mid-range human voices in there. Uh, they're also working with deconvolution. Some of you may know about convolution as a, a strategy for receptors that are spatially spread out uh, or temporally spread out and, and how those receptors interact with uh, an incoming signal. I, I really like the idea, but, but another thing that, that I do, one of the reasons I do music at the beginning of all my classes is that it disrupts normal thinking. I, I really like the word enchantment because it's the word chant in the middle of it. And I really think of music as a way to move us to a different mental space uh, you know, I, I would have my students meditate for 15 minutes at the beginning of class, but I can't afford the time. Uh, also, they have trouble. They have trouble sitting still for 30 seconds, uh, but the music allows them to do that. I also challenge them every time after I play a piece, I ask them, OK, what are we listening to? They say music. Eventually they figure out they're supposed to say music. But then the next question I ask them is what instrumentation did we hear in that piece? And it, it is somewhat amazing how even after, you know, 15 class periods, they can't do that because the music absorbs them and and turns off the, the you know, certain elements of their cognitive facilities, uh, being able to distinguish separate elements in their cognitive environment. And music does that in a different way than language does. And so although we read lots of books, uh, I, I want them to be exploring in their heads how those systems work and how the processes of listening are different from music and language, et cetera. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for a moment. I love that. I love this idea that, <clears throat> that you, could, you could create a, a high pass filter you know, using stones. Yeah, this is, you know, and, and, and you know, acoustically, maybe there's some kind of, uh, there's some pureness to that kind of a filter that you just can't get electronically. 
someone's going to harness that. You know, people, you're going to start to see people with these big stone based equalizers. Yeah, so the Diesel their... Blaster walking around. <laughs> yeah. So right. they're lugging it. Oh, yeah, and all the elephants carrying them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that, speaker design. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I I uh, have been a bit of a um, like music follower and was a junior sound engineer, not the head person in charge, for years. And there's something to having just a big wooden box that you. It's really hard to get that sort of sound from even the most sophisticated electronics if it's just like just acoustics as a physical function, right? So uh, I just pitch in with this thinking about kind of uh, these spaces. So archeologically, I think uh, there's a whole realm of people who think about what it's like to be embodied on a landscape. And I think that is a big way that we use to connect to our distant past, right? Because our bodies are still shaped mostly the same. Like we are all physically bigger, taller, more robust, uh, than most of our ancestors are going to have been. Um, and we can see this, I mean, we can measure the skeletons, but we can also see the stress that, uh, that, that, you know, the people that I'm, that are in this room right now, not necessarily everybody out there who might be hearing this, but you know, the people, the faces that I'm looking at, you probably don't have lines on your bones from, uh, severe, uh, famine experiences when you're growing up or lines on your teeth because of that. You, there's there's metabolic implications on further down the line. Uh, we're taller, you know, we're pretty healthy. Um, and so, you know, we were modified a little bit, you know, we're, you know, um, like when you go to a museum and you see old furniture and you see how tiny the beds are and you're like, that couldn't be possibly comfortable for me. And, and it's because we are just physically larger, but, you know, we're also, we have the same rough metabolism. We need to have a certain amount of calories to keep a volumetrically, you know, you know, us in our comfort zone and energetically working. We've got forward facing eyes. We've got grasping hands, our ears on the side of the head. So most of our bodies are really the same. And this is a great way to connect, you know, to the past. And I think that's why we can look at these spaces and then look at the, um, you know, we can find some of the, the tools. Music in the deep past is not as well explored as it should be. For Lascaux, which is such a great cave, uh, in the embodied experience is you actually needed to, to see it under flickering light, under like a torchlight. And then those aren't mistakes with the drawing. Is under torchlight, those herds look like they're running. So it's actually, uh, you know, and that's pretty easy to re recreate is, you know, go in, turn off your flashlight, have a torch, you know, that we, we don't do that anymore at Lisco, but we used to, and I actually knew a professor who had experienced it that way. Um, we don't do that anymore. Nobody goes in there unless they absolutely have to, because we also disrupt that environment by going in, introduce moisture and mold, and it destroys what's going on in there. And we want to keep that process as slow as possible so that we can have this direct connection as much as possible to our past. Um, but yeah, so it's actually the, that art is incredibly sophisticated in that it creates a, um, uh, an animation under the conditions that it would have been viewed under. And then I think uh, we've, I think archeologists have realized how many lithophones we've probably accidentally checked into the, uh, backfill pile. So a lithophone is an arrangement of rocks and it's basically like a xylophone, but it's just stones that maybe you shape a little bit or you go find the right one that makes the tone that you want and you kind of set them up. And uh, it, like, I think they showed up at more than one archeological site and somebody's like, what is it with like these long rocks that are otherwise unmodified? Um, and then you know, like somebody who knew something about like was in band or something like that and in you know marching band in high school was like oh it's a xylophone da, da, da. and and it was like this huge aha moment so we don't even have all of the tools we have some of the the the, the instruments that people might have been playing like flutes made out of bone these these lithophones um, and so yeah trying to kind of get back to what you know and of course we have voices right 
uh, and you know what were kind of the tools that were available, the the technologies that people had, and there's all sorts of stuff that doesn't preserve well that's made out of plant material that is gone to the sands of time. Maybe we'll be lucky enough to find one of those. And I, I finally just wanted, since we talked about Stonehenge a little bit, is understanding Stonehenge as being a part of a number of complexes. So there's Stonehenge is at the end of this very long promenade. And it looks like that was where uh, a lot of rituals around the dead took place. But there's another henge that was made out of wood with just a very few stones that's at the beginning part of that promenade. There's like multiple uh, of these circular arcades. That one was made out of trees. So it got me thinking about how does being in the tree space sound relative to being in the sound space, the stone space. And how does that inform our ideas about being in the living world versus being in the world of the dead? And, you know, how does that reflect it? How does that shape that? It's fascinating. So I don't know, just a little bit of like the technical background going on there. But uh, clearly, I can I love this stuff. So. So, yeah, you know, Pietro, I'd, I'd love to have your, your feedback on this, um, because, you know, this thought about, you know, what the human being defined as human plus environment, you know, I, I mean, working at SFI, there's one of my favorite papers that's come out of there ever, uh, actually came out just in this last year. It's the information theory of individuality. Hmm. Uh, David Krakow, our lead author, this piece on the, you know, using an information theoretical uh, formalism to understand the difference between a whirlpool and, a, you know, a colonial organism like an anthill uh, what they also, the authors also include like a spider and its web in that, you know, the, the way it's scaffolded by the environment. And then on the other end, the, you know, the sort of conventional individual, which a human being is not right. Because the human being, as we all uh, may be aware is, you know, way off the curve metabolically. It's, you know, using 30 times modern, modern human beings are using 30 times more like more uh, calories or, you know, more, uh, you know, our metabolism yeah. is, is using 30 times more than it would be uh, if we were just a, another mammal of the same body weight. And so really what the human is, is like, you know, extended into this environment, you know, through all the server farms and the supply chains and, and you know, agricultural stuff. So, you know, we're thinking about ourselves wrong in the modern age. And I get the sense that we were not thinking about ourselves we we did not have this this defect in antiquity and and so i you know I, I would love to know your thoughts on extended cognition in 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 the prehistoric and in the modern and and possibly in the future and like you know how you know where you see these changes and and why you think these changes have led to uh, a change in the sort of epistemic framing of the human being and, and the, I don't know, whatever else you wanted to, to go with there. <laughs> I mean, it's such a rich area and, and there are so many directions you can go and you're right. I mean, the human brain, you know, um, operates at about 20 Watts of power uh, compared to, um, you know, a supercomputer that takes about a million times more power and is processing information at roughly the same rate. Um, so, you know, uh, Kudos to nature for efficiency. Um, you know we're we're doing okay, but obviously we think very differently uh, than those supercomputers. Thanks to um, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, brain o brain OS. Uh, you know our operating system that evolved over over billions of years. Um, so my favorite example of um, you know, extended cognition is 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 this very high tech device called a pencil, you know, and paper, and you know, for me, it's it's quite powerful because my memory is poor, so um, I need a state space to store the information that I'm manipulating. If I'm trying to do some kind of math problem, you know, if you think about it, what really impedes us from multiplying big numbers in our head? Well, you know, I I personally can't keep track of more than about one thing at a time, but if I can write it down in my state space 
you know, that's shared with my brain through this, uh, you know, visual light based interface, then um, now um, I've, I've kind of, uh, um, you know, it's like I boost my RAM in a sense, you know, from if you want to use a computational uh, kind of metaphor. And, um, and this is hugely powerful. And, and, and I think, you know, what modern technology gives us is more ways to um, extend and combine our thinking with other systems, you know, whereby we are part of a shared cognitive system. So, um, you know, I, I do think in terms now of, you know, we have this physical universe, which serves as a state space uh, for the information processing that goes on. And we have different kinds of information processors. Some are natural and some are synthetic, you know, created by, by humans. Uh, there might be some created by, you know, other species uh, that I'm, I'm not aware of. Um, so I, you know, I speak more from, I, you know, I don't study that stuff. So I'm speaking more from, uh, uh, the perspective of humans. Um, and, um, and so if you, if you employ this model in your thinking, you know, that, that we, we have ways to process information and we have ways to store information. Um, and what is this all in service of is kind of the big question, right? And, and I think, you know, what, what we see that humans do remarkably well is predictive modeling. Um, especially under conditions of uncertainty. So this is our kind of, um, uh, this is what gives us a survival advantage that we can walk into a situation that's, that's largely unknown to us and we can very quickly impose this huge context of world knowledge on the situation and experiential knowledge and do this, this very fast predictive modeling that's not perfect and, and often flawed, but it's quick and it helps us survive whatever we're encountering in, in this situation. And that's why, you know, that, that's a basis for the, um, that as predictive modeling as an adaptive function. You know, and we're the most complex predictive modelers in the known universe, you know, that we're, that, that we're aware of. So now, what if we can link a bunch of brains together, link them to computers, link them to other natural systems, um, you know, as we get uh, improved ways of storing information and accessing it and better interfaces between humans and other systems, then, um, you know, presumably, if we, can, if we can figure out the right way to do it, we can collectively do better prediction you know, which means that we're not just surviving, you know, the situation where you walk into the woods and you see an animal that's unfamiliar and you have to decide what to do, but we walk into a situation where you see a pandemic that you've never seen before and you have to decide what to do as a species, right? And, and so I think, um, I think that's the power of, you know, collective intelligence, collective cognition, and extending cognition, you know, across agents and, and among agents. So I'll, I've spoken, I'll stop there for now. Well, I mean, I, so yeah, let's, that's awesome. Well, I, mean, I would love to just push you just a little bit further into, um, you know, and maybe Rich, you can chime in here too. You know, what is it that we lost? Um, it seems it seems like this conversation is uh, a whole lot more, uh, owes a lot more to the pre-modern way of understanding the human individual than th to the modern way of understanding the human individual. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious in a kind of Marshall McLuhan sense of, of cultural retrieval, what happens when looking forward, uh, we carry, or, you know, we exhume and carry this, this networked identity uh, and perhaps even like a networked subjectivity into our embrace of the challenges that we're facing now as a species and you know what that's going to feel like what that's going to you know how that's going to uh be articulated in our in our uh philosophy maybe tom you know you brought up bruno latour and uh, you know i know that you know uh, eric davis wrote a really excellent book recently uh high weirdness out on MIT, mit press where he he was talking about latour and and the psychogenic networks of of uh, scientific technologies you know and the way that the way that uh, uh, the the truly weird, the truly other, is not merely a social construct, you know, but it is it's something that is, you know, uh, uh, and and not simply enacted through our relations, but uh, kind of awakened through them or or made visible. So, you know, I guess you know what is what is the new subject object or, or self other relationship, say circa twenty two hundred, uh, in a in a world that you know people are are you know the 
in every way, it seems like, you know, the boundaries modernity has erected have been interrogated by the products of modernity. And so, you know, whether it's the national borders through electronic communication or climate refugee migration, uh, you know, manufacturing networks, et cetera, uh, we're having to dispense with this stuff. It's no longer it's no longer as effective for us as a framing for for seeing the world. I'm curious what else you think will be brought back and made commonplace and, uh, you know, what that'll feel like and what it'll look like. Whoever wants to roll with that. I mean, what we're seeing is, I mean, I'm seeing a lot more people just connecting to the natural world. Again, the importance of having access to green space in their cities. You're seeing that from in India and more people being able to see, you know, first time in decades, the Himalayas to the clearness of the water in um, Venice. And then, to, you know, with them, dolphins swimming along the canals. And that's what we kind of lost going back, you know, back to the conversation was about uh, Stonehenge and this kind of, you know, you've got the um, savannah theory and kind of bio, the concept of biophilia, where you, you're designing places that are like a forest and you come out into the savannah and you're seeing, you're opening up and the kind of this gateway and you're seeing that in our old um, older cities going back hundreds of years and kind of this kind of risk, you don't know where it's around the corner and, the, you know, the kind of the little peaking you know, through windows and seeing things where like, we enjoy those kind of curiosities. We're still effectively, you know, adult children, men more so than women. Um, and um, that is getting lost in a lot of our design for cities. It's very much regimented and ordered and it's kind of saying nature is a secondary thing. We're seeing that very much bringing in. You've got the fourth industrial revolution, which is kind of bringing in you know, it's the bio cyber physical systems all interconnected together. How that will work in the future, you know, you're, you're seeing that with the demented um, AI technology for identifying species, citizen science, by using the app called iNaturalist, where you're, you got to take a picture of a wild animal and then the crowd will help you find it. It'll identify itself by the picture using, you know, it knows where it is, it catalogs it and goes through and thinks it's, it's a spider, it might be this. But could you have this built into, say, an AR, uh, augmented reality headset as you're walking around to automatically identify everything so you don't go in that area because there's a risk of, you know, um, species that have transmittable diseases uh, and that kind of thing built in. Who knows? I mean, what people were, talk were talking about over the weekend is, you know, did we know about COVID? Well, if you read, like I did, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which coming from the early 2000s, it mentioned the threat of pandemics and um, zoonotic um, viruses being released. And that was 20 odd years ago. If And then you go back to that. So we've always known about it. We just nobody knew about it and dug it out from the information or nobody listened to those scientists. But I do find that a lot of people you speak to, it's about slowing down and appreciating life more instead of this fast paced world that we seem to be listening, living in. Although so many of our video calls seem to be stacked one against the other that you actually are then going back up to hyperspeed with multiple ones. So it's kind of that, crossover between we're slowing down understanding ourselves but 100 miles an hour on zoom i really want to jump in i'm such a bad east coast uh informal turn taker so the formal turn taking is like it's painful for me but i'm, I'm definitely trying to respect the process um I just really want to jump in on one thing with us being careful about defining who the we are that's disconnected and unnetworked from our environment. Because I really think that that's a very Western point of view and not, and it's one that if you learn, you know, about traditional knowledge systems that are living today, this is not the experience that I think we would see in a lot of other peoples and a lot of different other cultures. So, um, from my point of view, because I've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we, you know, because I, th I think a lot about in America, in the United States, we've really gotten to this very, I'm an individual and I'm optimizing. It's the selfish gene. I can't help it. I'm a lone wolf, which completely misunderstands wolf biology. Um, uh, but we have this narrative that we really create. And where did it come from? Like, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. You know, kind of goes back to, um, you know, maybe, you know, Greek ideal 
you know, you know, kind of like the mental model, the, you know, the ideal the atomistic point of view. Um, but we're always connected. We're filled with a biome that comes and goes out of our bodies. And, you know, that's kind of this pandemic is all of a sudden there's a new element to our biome that's coming into our bodies that we're not expecting. But this, you know, we're not isolated beings. Even now, we may think of ourselves that way, but I think a lot of our problems comes from thinking our, about ourselves that way and that that's not universally the experience across all cultures. That may be what the people here are feeling. And it is a very widely held Western point of view. But to just to make sure that we don't may that we don't say that other people are lacking in modernity because they don't happen to engage in this Western point of view is just kind of like a point there while we're, you know, sitting here, uh, you know, uh, engaging with each other. Definitely. I mean, you're supposed you. to go to go back to that. You would actually say, so we shouldn't impose our Western ways of thinking on to say the future mega cities that are coming about. So you are looking now that a lot of people in rural environments are moving into cities, and are they you know over generations will they lose that connection? So we don't want to impose this in the future cities in say sub-Saharan Africa that are going to appear. So you know I totally agree with what you say, but yeah, over time people will migrate to cities because jobs will be automated in the agricultural hinterland and um you know we could have climate change and those kind of things you know we don't know but it's making sure that we are not just saying here's the way that we design places like you know the big urban blocks and small right. parks are only available for the um, wealthier class i've actually got a book on my desk right now about looking to let me see if i can grab it really fast i haven't read it yet i admit it oh uh, yes low tech designed by radical indigenism so there's definitely people who are looking to traditional bodies of knowledge mm. and thinking about how we build in the future too and i don't think there's anything inherently disconnected i mean cities are, are their ecosystems and their organisms too we can model them as organisms we can model them as ecosystems they're really super connected places i don't think they're inherently non-human places it's I think that we need to you know if anything we need to embrace much more about how we're collectively connected to each other and interacting with each other and less that I live in my little pod and this is my space and I want it to be completely separate from all other spaces you know and unconnected from other humans I mean we do need some alone space too in our heads and in our bodies and so forth for our mental health but we have to I mean the worst thing that humans have come up to punish each other that's not directly messing with our bodies is solitary confinement. And we know that extended solitary confinement does have real physiological effects. So we're connected to other humans. We're obligate, dependent on being connected to other humans. And I think that the Western mindset is just really bad about thinking about that, but that doesn't mean it's not the case. So we should definitely be thinking about those ideas and borrowing from cultures that are happy to have Western people, because there's always a power differential, borrow from it. Um, and not everybody's happy about that. Um, to to think about how we do shape cities and urbanization, which is going to continue. And, you know, what does it mean in terms of do we ever leave the planet? You know, so because that's that is a hard problem. Um, if we are connected to each other and this rich ecosystem, that's pretty hard to put in a capsule and take up to the moon piece by piece to, to create an adequately complex network of things. Like I sat through the Martian going like, it would never work that way. <laughs> so, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in for the, like the, the fantasy of we can overcome it. But, you know, like, you know, you can't just drop potatoes into the dirt and it's going to work because the dirt has to be alive, too, and has this huge network of stuff. Anyways, Tom, I, Tom, I want to hear you chime in here. Uh, it's been a minute. Yeah, so so it, in, in certain respects, this may be like the stone skipping across the water because I've been listening to a lot of things and a lot of topics. So one topic that I think about sustainability, I hear people talk about sustainability and they say, we got to keep, you know, got to make sure we have a 20 year uh, you know, horizon on that. And I, and I think to myself, no, wait, can we do a 20,000 year horizon on what sustainability is, is all about? Um, 
there's an old saying, nobody knows who discovered water, but it certainly wasn't a fish because the fish was always already living in it. We're still, as a society, as individuals, as a culture, adapting to the Gutenberg press. I was talking to some colleagues about you know the future of the university, and they would say, well, the Zoom stuff, I mean, what does it mean if a student can just sit at home and just watch, you know, watch Zoom stuff? I mean, won't that just change fundamentally what the university was like? And at the time of the Gutenberg Press, there were universities going, but, but it's going to destroy higher education because students can just buy a book and sit at home and read it. You know, we won't need universities anymore. But that was hundreds of years ago. But the other thing that I think about is... Uh, Things like Julian Jaynes. Do any of you know Julian Jaynes, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral wind? Yeah, he, in yeah. essence, yeah. argues that agriculture and farming fundamentally changed the consciousness of humans. And he's got, you know, these weird things like, well, so there was lots of manure around, so psilocybin mushrooms were growing in the manure, so uh, people could then <laughs> go on trips and and. You know, so he's got this whole thing of the breakdown of the bicameral mind. But uh, you mentioned Marshall McLuhan, Global Village. I mean, he talked about that in the 50s. And in, in many respects, I mean, I'm in California. Uh, Jen, I guess you're on the East Coast somewhere. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the distance has, has been reconstructed in in many fundamental ways and the other thing that i think about another book that i have my students reading this semester is a book called earth abides if any of you've read that it's uh, written in about 1950 and there's a pandemic that kills kills 99 percent of the people the pandemic we're in right now kills one percent of the people um there's there's i mean we think of this as a terrible terrible pandemic but you know, a one percent mortality rate is—I uh, mean, yeah, I'm scared. I'm seventy. Uh, you know, I'm in a risk, high risk class. But there are other diseases out there that have uh, mortality rates way above one percent. What would what would our culture be like if if we experienced one of those things? Uh, so you know, I, I encourage my students to think about life on the you know at least 60 year time span what is your future going to be uh you know as sure you graduate from college when you're 22 what what is the world going to be like in 60 years how are you preparing yourself and you know cities get can we get rid of cities over the next 100 years uh maybe we need to i mean maybe maybe that's not a sustainable model of stuff. Anyway, I'll let it go. I know other people want to talk and we're closing in on an hour. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Pietro, I'd love to hear you speak and then we should probably make some closing comments. Sure. So yeah, I mean, it's with, with how rapidly things are advancing, it's hard to, to even, you know, look 20 years ahead, you know, uh, 20 years in terms of, you know, technology advancement now is like, you know, 200 or 2000 years of technology advancement uh, uh, 100 years ago. So uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but um, I think you, you get my point. So, and and I think one impact here is, um, I see it with my daughter, you know, uh, in, in the sense of ontogeny. And, and so, you know, we talk about the human condition and how these these changes of modernity uh, uh, might might have implications for that. Um, and on the one hand, you can't take the human out of the human. We're all still a bunch of, of monkeys, just really high-tech monkeys. Um, and we're all prone to the same, you know, sort of cognitive biases that, that we had before. Uh, technology sometimes makes us think we're smarter than we actually are. Um, but, uh, and by the way, those biases are, are there, they're part of our predictive engine. They're, they're, they're a side effect of something really powerful that we need. So I'm not trying to, uh, you know, uh, be negative about the human species. Um, but what I want to say is that, uh, you know, with my daughter, she, you know, she's been plugged in 
she's 13 now. She's been plugged in pretty much since she was born. And, you know, if you ever saw that Star Trek episode, uh, Next Gen with the Borg and who, they unplug him from the collective and he kind of goes nuts, right? So my daughter's like that. You unplug her from the collective <laughs> and, you know, no, quick, plug her back in. We, you know, we can't live with this. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, I think we have to recognize that in some sense, because of the, 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 the developmental environment has changed, the human condition has in some sense changed and the needs of these new generations might be different, that we might be imposing our own kind of ontological, uh, uh, ontogenetic perspective um, on, onto this. Um, and I think the next disruptive change um, is going to be eyeglass. So, right, this is the augmented reality uh, interface that Apple's developing. If anyone's going to do it right the first time, it's probably going to be them. And so you remember when people got cell phones, you know, and and then they they had the, the, the they got smaller and smaller, right? There were jokes on SNL, and then finally there were these little ear, you know, Bluetooth. Somebody time traveling from the past to the future would come and see all these people walking around the sidewalk talking to themselves and think everybody had gone completely mad, right? Because you can't see that they're all linked together talking to each other. So now this, and, and, and it's become a survival thing. So in, in developing countries, right, it's more important to have a cell phone in some sense than to have food because it, it, the cell phone connects you to the people so you can do business and you can have a livelihood. It's you know you can have a uh, you could you could spend you know half of your annual income on a cell phone and that would be a smart purchase from a survival standpoint, and it's going to be the same thing with augmented reality because now you're going to be further immersed into this information that's available you know uh, today on the internet. Um, but it's going to be superimposed on the world around us. So I think someone I think you know. Uh, um, was it Rich who was saying, you know, you're going to use something like iNaturalist through augmented reality and it's going to, you know, help guide you away from the poison ivy as you're maneuvering through the woods. You know, you're going to look at the road in front of you. Instead of looking at a GPS, the lines that you need to follow will be on the road, you know. And and so um, if you don't have this, you're going to be at a disadvantage. But because you do have this, you're going to be vulnerable now to all the new implications, you know, all the ways that you can be steered the way you're steered online today to go to this website or this website, your movements, your behaviors are all going to be steered and engineered through this immersive interface. And it's going to be on all the time. And so, so help me if you try to unplug me from this thing, because if I'm anything like my daughter, you know, it, it's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to be a bad scene, not me personally, but you know, speaking from the perspective of someone who grows up with that. So that is going to be, in my opinion, the biggest disruption um, in the next, you know, 10 years or so. And I can't even begin to predict all the implications of that, let alone what's going to happen in 60 years. Pietro, I'm so glad you brought this up because I was a Google Glass beta tester. <laughs> and I, I, I wrote a, a series of essays, actually the last piece I'm going to, I'm going to release publicly um, this week on, on augmented reality and how it affects human cognition and, and how it ties into the evolutionary arms races in, in uh, sensation, like, you know, sensory and, and cognitive faculties over the last 500 million years, like starting with the evolution of the eye. Um, God. Okay. So clearly we don't have enough time to go as deeply with all of you as I'd like. Um, I think we have a hard stop in like one minute. If I can get a confirmation in the chat from the organizers. Is yeah, that, that would be, we, that'd be perfect. Yeah. One or two more minutes. Okay. So, so really if anyone just has a, you know, parting thoughts, that would be great. But otherwise I just want to thank everybody who has uh, chimed in and everyone who's participated in this call. And I want to uh, invite each of the panelists to uh, join me uh, for a one-on-one -on, -one on future fossils in 2021. Cause I think, each of you is clearly a, a, a deep trove of insight, and I would love to spend more time with each of you. Anyone else have any any final words? No, just thank you. No, it was inspiring, amazing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Brilliant, everyone. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, thank you all great. so much. I hope yeah, you all have great. a wonderful closing ceremony. Thanks to the organizers of Complexity Weekend for facilitating this. And uh, if anyone is interested in connecting with me personally, reach out to me, uh, futurefossilspodcast at gmail.com or just Michael Garfield on Twitter. And I'm happy to connect. Thanks, everybody.